Why do wizards wear robes? It's the outfit of choice for most mages for some hidden reason. Maybe there's a separate issue of Magic Vogue that decided the snug is the it look for the past two millennia? But I'm going to avoid fashion reasons, since having anime apparel for half of my wardrobe disqualifies me from talking about the subject. Instead, I'll focus on two main areas. The first being why robes for magic make sense in a variety of magic systems and worlds, and the other being the history and actual origins of this stereotype in our own. This one is pretty popular, and it's wizards wear robes simply because they have no other choice. One recurring theme is wizards can't wear traditional armor, since it is made from metal. Many fantasy worlds have magic work comparable to electricity. After all, they are both invisible forces that can make some pretty lights. In this line of thought, metal is not only a conductor of electricity, but magic as well. The argument is that the metal you're wearing absorbs the spells you're trying to cast, and causes it to spread throughout the armor, and either completely not work, or misfire. Now this logic seems decent on the surface, but I'd like to think a class known for its intelligence would realize the potential benefits instantly, and mages would start using metal as their most valuable tool. Just like electrical wires, metal would become indispensable for long distance magic or communication and revolutionize combat. Mages would most likely carry a chain or metal whip and lash it at the target, making contact and then triggering their spells. This would make the magic attack stronger, since the magic wouldn't lose power as it travels through the air, and it would make the spells undodgeable. Essentially, wizards would be human tasers. Behold, the true peak of wizardry. Get on the ground! Get down on the ground! Get on the ground! Get down. Anyway, since I don't see any other uses of metal being magically conductive, I think it's safe to say that it isn't. But in some magic systems, metal is just outright hated by magic because it is seen as unnatural, which is confusing. Like everything in this forest is perfectly fine, but screw this one rock in particular. Some would then say, no, natural iron is fine, it's when it's refined by man that it is unnatural. Okay, so putting the rock in fire is against nature, but processing and weaving wool into a robe is what the trees would want. Also, metal is fine if it's gold and full of enchanted gems or used in a staff. The whole situation quickly becomes a mess, but I can explain it as simply a game of telephone gone wrong. In many cultures, for thousands of years, metals have been used as weapons against the supernatural. But it's not because metal is anti-magic, it's because metal is effective against the unholy. Precious metals are usually buried deep in the earth, so humanity's earliest source for them was from meteorites that landed on its surface. And since they came from the sky, aka heaven, they were holy and could fight off the evil monsters. This pretty much covered all evil things, including witches, since their magic came from the devil. But in a system of magic from another world, apart from our own religious influences, and without a clear definition of good or evil for the magic, the reasoning falls apart and should be ignored. So wizards probably can wear metal, they just don't. Probably for the exact reason you and I don't wear metal armor. There's no need. Metal armor only truly protects against piercing attacks like sword stabs and arrows. They can help lessen the blunt forces by distributing them more, but that impact is still there. A modern example would be bulletproof vests. They stop a bullet from piercing the body, but the force of the bullet still pushes into you, and it's normal to break a few ribs or even cause some internal bleeding or bruising. So unless you're planning to get shot specifically, like going to a war zone or an American school, there's no need to wear it. Wizards are usually in the back of the party, and by that formation planning are protected from being stabbed in a majority of physical fighting. Their number one weakness from a lack of metal gear would be the ranged combat such as arrows, which is consistent in most games. But I'm assuming a magical defense would be more reliable than any armor, and even protecting from the blunt damage as long as they had time to react. Wearing armor to prevent an unlikely situation would be detrimental in the long term, as the weight would tire them out more quickly. Remember, our academically inclined wizards traded gym time for library hours. Don't make them carry dumbbells for miles in case of an uncertain fight. You could sum it up as, wizards don't have proficiency in armor classes, unless they obtain it from some other source like a social or cultural background. But even taking all the above into account, more than likely a wizard would be attacking and defending against other wizards, and in that case metal armor would be detrimental, not because it could conduct magic, but because of what it already conducts, heat and electricity, so a fireball or lightning bolt spell would become significantly deadlier to an opponent wearing metal. This brings us to another possible reason. Perhaps wizards wear robes because they offer magical protection instead of physical. Let's assume that magic exists inside of life, and is a form of energy. According to our second law of thermodynamics, Energy tends to spread out over time. We can then reasonably assume that organic material is magically insulative. This is because if there is magic inside of certain people or creatures, it needs to stay there and not just leak out to be lost to the environment. Magic would then be just like heat in our body temperature. We've got our skin and hair to keep the heat in our body, and animals use feathers and fur to maintain their own body temperature. An animal in the Arctic has warmer fur and skin because it needs to keep the heat from escaping and the cold from getting in. Insulation is a wall that works both ways. So the skin and feathers of a powerful magic creature would be designed to hold in their powerful magic and block from escaping, but it would also be fantastic for blocking enemy spells trying to come in. However, these materials would be hard to get since you'd have to kill powerful magical creatures to get them. 
Instead, they'd use materials cautiously and likely spread the materials lightly across a normal base robe, lining the robe with unicorn hair or phoenix feathers, optimizing the protection with minimal material. The more expensive robes would have more materials used or higher quality ones and offer more protection. Hopefully they could find some magical creatures with good wool, but the animals aren't the only life available. It would be better to grow magical plants that could be mass produced, whose fibers could be turned into magical cloth for robes. Having magically insulative material wouldn't just increase the magical protection, but also their magical capacity. Back to our heat analogy, if you wear a heat insulating material such as a jacket or blanket, it doesn't give you any heat, it just helps trap your escaping body heat so you can keep yourself warmer. If wizards wear robes because they are magically insulating, they will leak less magic naturally and might even increase their total mana capacity. Additionally, the designs for robes could be better for magical recovery. In most games, the benefit for mages wearing robes is increased magic regeneration. Robes are certainly very breathable and freeing, and if magic comes from the environment, another common theme, the more air circulation could help replenish their own mana supply. The final in-world reason why wizards would wear robes is silly but unfortunately all too realistic. It's their pride. By definition, wizards are ones who harness powerful forces and bend them to their will. A strong wizard has no need for borrowed power or protection, depending only on their knowledge and ability. A wizard wearing armor might indicate a lack of confidence in their own power and mark them as a weak user and an easy target. Now that we've explored a few logical in-universe reasons why, let's get to the origin of the myth itself. Every story has a kernel of truth, and that's true for even little things like the dress attire of magical people. Wizards are fantasy version of scientists, exploring the secrets of the universe on the magical side as opposed to the natural. The image of a wizard wearing robes conducting experiments in lone ivory towers comes from academics wearing robes conducting experiments in their lone ivory towers. So, wizards wear robes because medieval academics did, but the real question is why did these scholars dress like that? The short answer is scholars wore robes because priests did. But let's dig into this a little bit more. About a thousand years ago, practically no one could read. But that wasn't the biggest deal because there was only one book anyway. The members of this book club were called the clergy, and they wore robes. One reason they wore them was symbolic, as wearing a simple robe shows the disregard for the material world and emphasizing the spiritual one instead. But there were more practical reasons as well, which is my favorite being they were simply really warm. These clergy members spent the majority of their time in temples and the cathedrals which did not have central heating, so thick robes made those harsh winters bearable. There were other practical bits of the attire, like the hood. It could keep the bald heads of the tonsured warm, or keep your eyes from wandering during prayer. In certain areas, the monk's habit was even detachable so they could carry all sorts of goods. Now the clergy had a problem. They wanted everyone to read their book, but no one could read. So in the 12th and 13th centuries, the first European universities were founded and religious scholars came in to learn about the Bible and the other various literary skills required to read it. These scholars were also made to wear robes, as many had undertaken minor orders or vows, but also to separate the newly grown scholar population from the local towns. As universities grew in popularity, the sole focus for academia for religious purposes waned. They were still run by the church. After all, it wasn't until 1858 that British law no longer required academic study to be taught by church clerics. But not all students were expected to become clergy members, and there were other academic avenues. The robes still stayed though, as those beautiful stone universities were still exceptionally cold. The robes were still simple as well, but not for spiritual reasons, but because of sumptuary laws in England. This kept citizens from wearing material above one's social or economic class. Academics were fairly poor, so it's nice to see that some things haven't changed. But once again, the robes continued to offer practicality, as it is suggested master's graduate's robes had long, extended sleeves which historically could have been used for pockets for academic materials. This is important because actual pockets wouldn't be invented for men's apparel until the 17th century, and we're still working on it for women. Eventually, academics would become completely secular, but the robes still lasted. In fact, American universities still wore robes until the end of the Civil War, and in Oxford University, robes were required daily until the 1960s. Nowadays, most schools only require more modern versions to be worn at graduation, to honor the history of academia like some sort of Civil War reenactors. It's this academic history that finds itself woven into our fantasy cultures. Humans have terrible yet incredible imaginations. We can create entirely new worlds, creatures, and universal laws like magic, but fail to imagine a new color. This is because everything we dream always comes from a seed of truth. Often when we explore some of the greatest fantasies, it's fun to follow the trunk down to its roots or to even add our own new branches. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe as it really means a lot. I tried a more casual approach this time, so let me know if you liked it in the comments below. See you next time.